more than a last year, uh, which is based on a uh, few technologies I was working on for FreeBSD. Uh, and this, this is a security appliance. Um, so who am I? Uh, my name is Paweł Dawidek. Uh, I live in Warsaw. If you have been to EuroBSDCon last year, uh, I was partly responsible for that. Uh, and I have those two things I need to somehow uh, work on. I'm running my own company, but I also, as a hobby, uh, work on FreeBSD, let's say my spare time. Uh, and it's been almost 10 years uh, since I got my uh, source commit bit, so it was finally time to actually do something with all this stuff I did for free to actually uh, try to make some money of it. But uh, I must admit that this will be an uh, extremely hard talk for me because, of course, uh, on one hand I'm talking about FreeBSD, but on the other hand I'm talking about commercial products. So. People may, may not well receive if I will try to cross the line and, I don't know, to advertise too much, so I will do my best not to cross the line. So before the talk, I will just prepare a bit. <laughs> we can go. <laughs> okay. okay I will. Uh, so first of all, uh, the, the appliance itself. It's called Fudo. And of course, uh, what I could now tell you about is uh, uh, how nice the chassis is, how red it is, uh, how you can, uh, I don't know, and I'm not making this up, remove every single disk separately and just insert it back, or uh, that will include cool red panel uh, free of charge uh, <laughs> with a lock on it so you can lock the panel and nobody can steal it. I could, to all, uh, I could tell you about all this stuff, but I won't, even though I just did. <laughs> uh, okay. what, what I will tell you uh, instead is, uh, I'll take this off as well, it just looks silly. Uh, I will tell you how it works. So, uh, Fudo basically is uh, what we call a tool, uh, big brother tool. You put uh, Fudo into your network and in c it can intercept all the remote sessions, uh, like SSH, remote desktop, VNC, and stuff like that. It will intercept the session, decrypt all the traffic, store decrypted traffic, and you can then replay all the sessions and actually see uh, what was going on. So if something bad happens, you, you have a proof, you can show what actually uh, happened. So uh, that was the idea for the product. <coughs> But let's start from the beginning. Uh, we, of course, had to choose some kind of version control system. And uh, uh, this is a pretty important task because, of course, if you use nice version control system, it will help you if you uh, choose badly. It can actually make your work harder. So uh, we tried. Uh, we tried most of them, I think. CVS, Subversion, Mercurial, Perforce, Git. And we couldn't make the, uh, the call. Uh, so I came up with a great idea. To actually, with, I came up with objective comparison of those, uh, all those systems. Uh, it sounds silly at first, but uh, bear with me. So uh, any guesses? Uh, with what Perforce rhymes? Any guesses? Yes. The right course, of course. That's very cool, but uh, Mercurial, for example. It doesn't rhyme, which uh, is pretty important. OK, uh, any guesses for Git? I will give you a hint. And uh, subversion? <laughs> if you just uh, find the proper way of comparing things, it's just clear. It's, you don't have to 
do many research to actually figure out which is the best. Okay, any Perforce employees <laughs> here? Okay, so all those us leaking was for nothing again. Got it. Okay, next, uh, building from source. Uh, this is, of course, uh, important, especially if you try to leverage various open source projects. Uh, Uh, we, we try to simplify all the projects. So actually what you do, you just uh, enter the uh, top source directory, just type make and we produce a uh, bootable install image as well as signed upgrade image uh, for, to do the upgrade. So this is very, uh, the output is very, uh, the outcome is very uh, easy, but uh, of course we have uh, we have to compile not only FreeBSD, but if you start build a product, and especially you don't have too much resources, you will end up leveraging many other open source projects. And uh, of course, as you can imagine, every single one of them have different way to actually compile, build, and, and do stuff like that. So, uh, so what we did, and uh, I admit, this is not the most beautiful way to do stuff. Uh, and I'm sure there are many ports committers who will tell you how to use ports to do this stuff. But what we, this, this basically works for us. Our bigger problem was how to actually recompile the stuff that changed and not to recompile every single dependency as you saw there are many dependencies there. So how to figure out which dependency actually changed. So what we did, uh, is to just prepare a simple uh, shell function uh, which takes, as a first argument, takes a directory to enter and, uh, and build. The last argument is actually commands uh, we want to execute uh, while we enter to that directory. And you can optionally uh, add more arg arguments in the middle. Those are additional directories we want to scan. And we are looking uh, for dot build done file in there. And if there is a file, dot build done file in there. We just check if this is, uh, if there is any file in those, one of those directories that actually is newer than dot build done. And that's it. Uh, it was pretty simple, but work works extremely well for, well for us. Uh, okay. So now I will tell you about, well, short introductions because I'm sure uh, most of you uh, are aware of some of the technologies I'm using here. Uh, so we, of course, use Jelly for block level uh, data encryption. We have 12 disks to actually encrypt. Uh, we have some uh, optimizations to open crypto framework, which I didn't yet upstream, but uh, we can, yes, we can, uh, we can encrypt uh, all those 12 disks uh, without losing any performance. So actually, we, if each disk uh, provides some kind uh, around uh, 120 megabytes per second throughput, we can actually uh, encrypt traffic going to, this, to all those disks at once using just a single four core CPU. Of course, we use ISNI uh, to do that. Uh, and Jelly provides a lot of other stuff we don't really use, like integrity verification or uh, multi-factor user keys and stuff like that. Yeah, some other stuff. Uh, so of course we use ZFS as well, uh, and you are, if you are not familiar with uh, with ZFS, I'm not sure under what rock you were living uh, under for the last few years, uh, but ZFS provides all those cool stuff. Uh, we just need a fraction of the functionality, but ZFS is very convenient for us, so uh, <coughs> we just use it. Capsicum, that's the, uh, that's the cool technology that uh, is in FreeBSD now. Uh, it provides two uh, basic functionalities: uh, tight sandboxing, where you just type tap, uh, where you just call tap, cap enter, and 
you enter in really tight sandbox. I will tell, I will talk this subject to death in, in a moment. But and capabilities. Uh, I will talk more about capabilities uh, during Dev Summit track uh, in two hours or so. Uh, but this is very important. I will show you how we use it in practice. Uh, Okay, so let's let's try to boot the machine. Uh, the lesson we learned, well, the lesson we <laughs> it wasn't a lesson. Uh, our design goal, also with our uh, previous products like authentication system, was that we we never keep customers secret at our company anywhere. Uh, we thought that this will never pay off, but then someone break into RSA all the secrets and actually it started to be very important to not keep the customers secrets uh, around and we never did that and food also don't do that uh, when we ship uh, a box to, to the customer we also include two pen drives which are empty and during during first boot uh, we generate encryption keys for jelly and we store those keys on those pen drives uh, you only need one of those pen drives either of, of them uh, to actually boot the machine and you only need the pen drive during the boot. Once the box is running, you don't need the pen drive. So of course it depends if you can trust physical security of your da data center or not. You can leave the pen drive. If you do, you should take it away if you don't. And of course you cannot boot machine or access any data Fudo collects without those pen drives. Yes, it's a backup, simple. Because if you lose those two, uh, you can't access the data. At least that, that's the hope. Uh, file system layout or more uh, partition layout we use, uh, we have this very small uh, partition, which is just row four kilobytes for very basic configuration, stuff like uh, serial number of, of the given appliance, uh, we don't want to use file system in there, so it, it's just raw storage, uh, very small, to use for very critical uh, bits that identify the box, for example. We, of course, need a boot partition. And we have uh, three partitions, uh, UFS partitions, uh, where we keep our operating system. All those partitions, when, when we operate on them, uh, they, uh, they are read-only. So when we install the system, uh, it, it never gets uh, mount read-write. So entire operating system we use is on read-only partition. And we need three because this is how we upgrade. When we need to upgrade, we just put, uh, we put upgrade image on next partition and we will try to reboot uh, using that partition. And of course we use some swap and ZFS, which is actually jelly encrypted partition with all the data we use. So there is no really place to, uh, the rule here is that uh, the file system is either read only or encrypted. So uh, how we do the upgrades. Uh, this is the partition that, uh, that the uh, operating system is running, running from at this point. When we uh, store upgrade image on the next partition, we use, uh, uh, GPT attributes I added to FreeBSD some time ago, and we mark uh, this new partition using two attributes, boot me and boot once. This basically means that if we try to reboot, uh, the GPT uh, boot code will try to find partition with this boot once flag, will clear the flag, and will try to boot from it. If it fails, on next boot, actually it clears uh, it clears boot me. Well, I don't want to go into too much details, but uh, the idea is that the new partition will be boot, will be tried only once. If we fail, the next boot will actually boot us again from this partition, and also we will be able to detect that the boot failed. So uh, after boot, uh, we can either fail, and uh, this is what we get. Uh, uh, this will be the flag that will be set on next boot, and we can see that uh, our upgrade actually failed, or 
it succeeds. And we set only boot once flag without boot me. And we have, uh, and of course, when everything is done, but this is done by rc.d script gpt boot, uh, it will remove boot me flag from the fourth partition and set the boot me flag on the fifth partition. Uh, those are all the components we use for upgrade, more or less. So we have GPT boot, which uh, during boot detects if the boot succeeded or failed, uh, sets up all the attributes properly. Uh, all, the, uh, all the upgrades we have to uh, do runtime, we just implement in rc.d style scripts. Uh, Currently, we have around 20 of those, uh, and we store them in etc upgrade directory. And what we do, there is a rc.d script that actually copies all the, uh, all the upgrade scripts, which are not in the done direct di directory yet, to the to-do directory. Once those scripts are copied, uh, we will uh, continue the booting process, and we will execute all of them. So for example, if we have to change if we have to add some tables to database and do stuff like that, uh, this will all happen during the boot. And we can, uh, leveraging this mechanism, we can actually also set uh, dependencies properly, what should run before what, and stuff like that. And this doesn't add uh, to the booting process because, uh, uh, because once the script uh, is successfully executed, it is moved to done and it won't be part of the, of the next boot. So it doesn't really cost much to, to have many of those scripts. ZFS. Uh, so as I said, this is a file system uh, developed at Sun Microsystem. Matt is here, who actually co-founded ZFS at Sun. Uh, and I'm sure he will be happy if you join, uh, if you all come to uh, ZFS both later uh, today. Uh, and I ported it to FreeBSD. Uh, what were the goals? Uh, as you can imagine, we deal with extremely sensitive data because if we decrypt all the encrypted traffic, there has to be some sensitive, sensitive data, but we also store stuff like user passwords, and all kind of different, very sensitive stuff. Uh, so the box have to be secure, of course. Uh, we need full ac accountability, uh, which means that every user who logs into the destination servers through FUDO, is, we can provide some strong aut authentication. So for example, you have uh, five servers with only root account, and you allow every single user to log into this root account. If you put FUDO in front of those servers, every one of those users has to have individual login on FUDO, and individual passwords or method to authenticate, and uh, when he logs in using his own login, the FUDO will switch the login to root, and uh, the user will be logged automatically to root account, but FUDO will know which user it actually is. So we can, we can know if that was the user who actually breaks something or someone else. One of the things I, I would change in OpenSSH uh, is to by default actually log which uh, SSH key was used to authenticate. I would have to put them here. Yeah. yeah, that would be very useful. Uh, uh, we can provide strong authentication using some external authentication server. Uh, we have to provide secure storage because we have to store all those sensitive data. And we have to secure all the protocols handling because hopefully we will, uh, we will, uh, we will support many different kinds of protocols. Currently we support SSH, uh, remote desktop, VNC, we have My MySQL and Oracle in, in the works uh, and stuff like that. For some, we leverage open source projects. For example, for remote desktop, we use FreeRDP mostly, which is, which is really great when it comes to how it is developed, but not really secure. And we can, of course, uh, 
spend many months trying to audit every single uh, protocol code we use or use Capsicum. And of course the performance is also very important because for every cryptographic session we have to pay the price, uh, we have to multipl uh, multiply the cost uh, by three. Because if we terminate SSH session, we have to talk to this client. This is one, uh, 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 one place where we pay the cost of the cryptography. Then we have to connect to the destination server. And this is totally different session, so we have to pay the price again. And we have to store the data. So also we have to pay the price because all the data is encrypted. So what we do to protect on this data? We use uh, Jelly, of course, with AES uh, in XTS uh, mode. Uh, we store keys, as I explained, on pen drives. We use ZFS checksum SSH, uh, SHA uh, 256. Uh, that's why we don't really use uh, Jelly verification, which is maybe a bit weaker, but uh, still enough. Uh, we, of course, have to use uh, AES uh, NI acceleration in uh, Intel uh, CPUs. It just allows us to do all those, uh, do the cryptography really, really fast. Uh, we also support trusted timestamping. So actually, you can uh, contact some uh, some other site and actually ask them to uh, to timestamp uh, the given session, so we know that nobody played with the session afterwards. And we use uh, write Z2, so uh, any two disks we have in the box can fail and we will still operate. Can you elaborate on the timestamp thing? Like how are they communicating? Uh, the trusted timestamp basically means that once the session is done, uh, we, uh, we calculate hash from the session, like uh, SHA1. And we use uh, remote uh, site. There are, there are sites which provide trust and timestamping, and those are trusted sites, let's say, and they sign such uh, hash, and we store uh, signed hash. So then we know that uh, the session wasn't modified later, and that's for some very important. Uh, yes, for ZFS we use uh, only those well, not, not entire functionality, of course, but uh, the key ones for us is write Z2 compression, especially for SSH sessions. It saves us a lot of space. Uh, we are looking forward to actually integrate LZ4. And we use snapshots to replicate uh, session data uh, within a cluster. Um, how we protect session? This is, for me, this is the most exciting part of FUDO which I cannot share with my customers because they don't care. Uh, <laughs> but I will share with you. So uh, Every single session has two processes that, uh, that uh, handle the given session. We have a master process, which is just generic process. It doesn't know anything about the protocol uh, itself. And we have slave process, which implements uh, the specific protocol, SSH, remote desktop. Uh, master, of course, has to have some privileges, and uh, slave is closed in Capsicum sandbox. Uh, slave runs all the logic. Uh, master is initially responsible only for authentication. And master also provides all the resources and capabilities the slave needs to actually work. So when we execute slave, it doesn't get much. Uh, we provide one second of CPU time. It has uh, five minutes to actually authenticate the given user to provide graphical login window or uh, in case of SSH to interpret uh, protocol uh, specific uh, information to actually extract username and password. Uh, it gets only 32 megabytes of memory and access to read-only access to a configuration directory. So if it has to provide a uh, graphical uh, login window, there is, this is where the graphics is. And of course, it has to has, have communication socket with master process. Uh, 
Yes, what it cannot access. Thanks to Capsicum, uh, it has no access to, uh, to any other file in the system, which is very important because the other files are probably sessions with sensitive data. It cannot access networking. It cannot lease processes. Uh, of course, if we drop uh, privileges to some unprivileged user, there might be different processes with the same UID running, which we could p-trace, signal, and stuff like that. So in capability mode, you cannot access any global namespace, actually. So uh, in Capsicum-like systems, you only have access to the resources that will delegate it to you. So Slave has almost no resources at all. So that play is like a jail or something? No, it's just a process. Yeah, single process. Uh, uh, so Slave is responsible for extracting all the credential. Once he get uh, he gets username and password, he can uh, sends uh, he sends the username and password to the master process. Master process has to authenticate those, uh, authenticate those credentials, and the master process decides if the user actually provide correct password or not. If he did. Uh, we will add some additional memory. We will uh, remove the CPU time limit. Uh, we will also provide uh, up and only descriptor to the session dump. So now he can actually write something to the disks, but only up and. So if he breaks into the session later, he cannot really even modify what was uh, stored already. But even after authentication, it still cannot open any other network connection. I'm not sure if I mentioned in the previous slide. Uh, if the user uh, is authenticated correctly, we also provide the scriptor with the connection to the destination server. Because Slave, of course, on its own cannot connect anywhere. Uh, so even after authentication, uh, Slave still cannot access any other server or any other file in the system or actually anything except for processing this particular session. So it's really strong security provided by Capsicum we try to leverage in, in the product. And it works great, if you were wondering if. Uh, OK, uh, what's next? Multimaster clustering. Yes, this is something we added not, not that long ago. Uh, we replicate everything asynchronously because we don't really need to do anything like, uh, anything better than that. Uh, we use ZFS send receive to actually replicate the data, and we use our own daemons to replicate database. But there were a few challenges actually to implement this uh, because, of course, there are a few potential problems when you replicate database and. Uh, I'm very sorry about that. I'm not really a da database guy, so maybe this is all obvious to some. But uh, so uh, the question we asked: What we lose uh, if we if we replicate the data uh, async, not sync? Because if we need to replicate data synchronously, we have to use hast, which is block level replication. But of course, what you want to do when you replicate is to actually move the logic as uh, as high as possible. Uh, as high as possible it is, the more information you actually uh, know if there is was a split brain or not and stuff like that. So uh, do we have to uh, synchronously replicate the data or not? That was one of the questions. Another one, how uh, do we avoid collisions of uh, identifiers uh, for, uh, for table rows? Or how to distinguish insert from delete? Let's say two, two nodes connect, and one has an entry, and the other doesn't. And how can we figure out if actually this one, someone on this node, delete the entry, or someone on this node insert the entry? And we should replicate the insert, or we should replicate deletion? Uh, and of course, how to deal with update collisions? Uh, the same row was updated on two nodes. What to do about that? Um, so the solutions. Uh, in our case, we lose nothing by doing async uh, replication. Uh, 
what the user sees is actually uh, administrator on one node adds new user and the user will appear in five seconds on another node. That's really not a problem. So for us, we don't really need uh, synchronous replication, so it saves a lot of work. Uh, how to avoid collisions? So of course, what we came up with, every single node in the cluster has some serial uh, ID. So what we did, we actually we start ID numbers on every on each cluster node. Uh, we multiply the serial number, so we still have few uh, few bits left uh, because the uh, identifiers are 64 bits. Uh, so we just start at some number, and we just know that there will be no collision because every single node has different range uh, of IDs uh, it can use. How to distinguish insert from delete? We never delete. Uh, <laughs> easy, uh, easy solutions are the best. Uh, what we do instead is to actually we, we uh, set removed at row. We keep removed at row uh, for every uh, in every table we uh, we need to replicate. And if removed at row is set we know that this was removed, and we can replicate this as an update, for example. Uh, and how to deal with update collisions? Uh, we have uh, some fields in every table that help us to do that. So for example, the daemon that is going to send, uh, send, send updates uh, uh, to another node, uh, he will ask he will ask for um, for everything from uh, if if this was modified on me, I'm interested in modified at uh, field, and I compare the time from the last replication with uh, modified at time. So it was if if it was modified on modified on me, I'm interested in modified at time. If it wasn't modified on me. I'm more interested in received at time because if I received the update from uh, from different node, it could be an hour later than it was modified. I know that I have to replicate it still to to different nodes. So those two fields actually uh, allow us to replicate all the data and don't lose any update. And what we do for collisions, we just don't care because uh, this is also easy solution uh, because this is. Uh, if two administrators uh, modify the same user on two different cluster nodes, this is more or less the same as two of them doing the, the same operation on one node. They can still log into one node and still modify the same user. And basically, uh, the one that did the save later wins. So uh, this doesn't really matter for us, that's the exact same scenario. And for sessions, uh, that's also easy because sessions are modified only on one uh, one cluster node and never again. So I'm not good at conclusions. I'm not sure how much time we have, but not much. But I'm not very good at conclusions. So some random ones. <coughs> you should name your uh, version control system wisely because people may not pick it up. Uh, use cool technology that FreeBSD provides. It's all useful for us, so uh, we are very happy with the technology. Uh, don't forget to lock food the panel. And probably in, in the future avoid my talks, I don't know. Okay, uh, any questions? Yes? Uh, so Fudo stands. This is some uh, from. This is from Japanese, but because we can have some people from Japan, I maybe <laughs> it's better idea to explain what it means. But it means something. Uh, this was <laughs> <laughs> marketing's department idea. So uh, and the customers. Actually, every company that have some external contractors or cooperate with any company that actually uh, 
have to connect from uh, from uh, remotely. Uh, companies are very good to provide VPN access to to anyone, and they feel secure. But actually, if something breaks, you actually don't know what break, uh, why, and uh, who did that, and stuff like that. So. Uh, it's not only about security. Some of our customers actually do it for uh, to account external contractors, so they can actually watch if they do the work or the session is just idle. So uh, external contractors are probably the uh, the best uh, use case for this. Some customers also use use it for local admins as well. Admins are not happy about that, but security officers are very happy. Um, any other questions? Yes. So, uh, I wonder if one of you can add to them. We were only discussing it during the authentication and uh, procedures for, for authenticating users. Are there any other uses of Capsicum within the product? I mean, are all of those, uh, I guess, some of the other products that you have listed, uh, are they also Capsicum? Uh, uh, well, uh, in case of Fudo, the Capsicum. Uh, currently is used only for services that are safe uh, facing internet so uh, because when you connect to uh, to administration panel for example you do it from management network we don't sandbox those yet but we do want to, uh, to sandbox this as well uh, but it's python so it's a bit harder uh, it will take a while but the most critical uh, path is where we get connection. We receive connection from user which is not yet authenticated, and then during the session it might be even authenticated, but it might be evil. So we still want to keep it in, in a sandbox. So that's most important bit for us. Yes. Uh, you talked a lot about development. Can you talk a bit more about Capsicum? Yes, that's interesting subject. Uh, <coughs> In our previous product, which was authentication system, the testing was pretty easy because we could automate almost everything. Uh, it was very easy. In this case, where you have different kind of protocols, it all required to have uh, actually some uh, remote systems to, to log into and stuff like that. It's much harder, so there is much more manual work to do it. So unfortunately, we, can, we cannot automate too much. Uh, on the other hand, we do automate stuff like uh, when we try to figure out how many sessions we can actually handle. For one box, uh, we did get like 50,000 sessions, SSH sessions, very idle, but uh, we did. So uh, testing is mostly uh, manual, unfortunately, because I'm a big fan of automating testing. But yes? Uh, what sort of output do you get? Like, you don't have to screenplay what the user is doing, or do you yes. have to command what you're typing? Or exactly. You you see way? the you see the screen as the user saw it, but through web. <coughs> and we do provide some more stuff, like you can uh, watch live session, you can even join to the session and type some password <coughs> for the user and stuff like that. We of course record if you join the session. We, of course, record that those are uh, keys or mouse movements from the uh, web panel, from this administrator, because uh, that would be uh, weak proof if we could join the session and just do something evil and uh, accuse user for doing it. So we do record all this stuff. Uh, but yes, this is basically, this is not really a video session, because even if user uh, types something which you uh, cannot see, uh, in our player, you actually can see all all the keys he types. So, something like that. Yes. How's the perforce license? Sorry. How's the perforce license? Uh, we actually have very small development teams, so we fit into free perforce license. And your your source code management is perforce, correct? Yeah, that's right. What's the license? Uh, for our software. The user. Is it freely available? Or is it uh, this product? No, the, the perforce uh, source code management license. Instead of SVN, you're using perforce? Yes. Do you pay for that? No, as I said, we have really a uh, small development team, and perforce provides, uh, well, we did pay uh, for perforce uh, uh, previous years, uh, but now perforce actually extend the free license, so we fit into free license now. 
and they call us to tell us that we can actually use three license numbers. So that's cool. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, no, okay. Thank you very much. anyone wants one of these <laughs> here for grabs One is SAS, one is SATA, uh, but we can connect all 12 disks there, so uh, that's not a problem. We use Intel, this is a uh, two sockets uh, motor board, but we, in default uh, version, we just provide one CPU and one for core CPU. What's, the, what's been your experience with VFS? So far, very good. It's a pretty young product, so, uh, but you know, it's, it's good. Okay. I have some experience with VFS. I know, that, that's why I'm asking you. <laughs> yeah. 